I don't want you to get too wrapped up about the physiologic changes with the inhaled agents at one match. <clears throat> the extent that I would like you to know it is on this chart that I made for you guys. It should be pretty self-explanatory, right? You have one MAC of agent that you're delivering. So does the drug make it, the parameter go up or down, or does it change at all? The NC is no change. So if I were to say which drug drops SVR the most, you would say desflurane. And then I put this on black piece for you. Um, and if there is a minus sign, and there's one minus sign in each of them, then they all do it equally, right? So do we have any questions on this chart? This is to clear up that confusion that I unfortunately created with you guys for that Excel sheet. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> all right, so let's get back. We left off, had a nice discussion about midazolam, and now we're going to have a drug that reverses midazolam. And there's a couple points that we have to highlight about it. It's called romazicon, flumazenil, and it comes 0.1 milligram per ml. It binds to the same site that the midazolam binds to, but its conformation is such that it doesn't allow any action, and therefore it is a competitive antagonist. A competitive antagonist. One of the clinical points is this. If you give Flumazenil at the same time that you give midazolam, you're not going to see the effect of midazolam for about an hour. But then you'll start to see the effects of midazolam if you give enough of a dose, because its half life can be up to 80, 90 minutes. Why, if you give the antagonist and the agonist, you don't see a clinical effect, at least for an hour, and then you see it? What happened? So Richard's got it. The half-life of the flumazenil is shorter than that of the midazolam. And so there's a potential for resedation. Now remember I said that when you give a benzodiazepine, it's hard to make someone apnea. But do you in the OR just give benzodiazepines? No. But you might use the flumazenil to reverse some of your midazolam effects. You might do that on occasion. But if you do, just realize that maybe an hour later, you might want to stick your head in and say, hey, how are they doing? Because if the midazolam effects come back, then they might synergize the opioid effect that is probably still going to be on board. Sir, yeah. aren't you worried about lowering that CD threshold of midazolam? Lumazenil has a huge therapeutic index, and in and of itself, it doesn't, because GABA will still work physiologically. It's just that you won't get that allosteric modulation from the midazolam. Because if you had no midazolam in your body, this receptor will still open. You know what I mean? <coughs> Did that make sense to everybody? That's a great question. You're not going to, this is, this has no intrinsic activity in man. It just gets in that receptor site and it sits there. But that's not the receptor site that opens the channel. That's just the site that makes it more efficient. But it's still going to work. Right? What about the patient who's chronically on benzene? Aha! Or the alcoholic. There is a potential in the chronic alcoholic or the chronic person on chronic benzos, there is a potential for some type of withdrawal type symptom. In the alcoholic especially, you might see what type of an effect. 
if you take away alcohol from a chronic alcoholic, what do they DTs, right? Delirium tremors. That type of effect might happen. You're talking if you administer the mass practice in the chronic benzo. Or chronic alcoholic. Could you see side effects from those two populations? Yes. Do you always? No. This graph here, the red and the blue, is trying to point out the statement I made about giving the drugs at the same time and the course of their half-lives. In the blue, you see the decrement, the decay of midazolam. And in the red, you see the decay of the flumazenil, the romazicon. And you can see that after about an hour and 20 minutes, that in some populations, given a sufficient dose, that Versed is still on board and the flumazenil is not. The graph on your left, while it is nice to know, it is not required to memorize that. So if I have you look at this, you know that the half-life is much shorter for flumazenil on both the T1 half alpha, T1 half beta. The volumes of distribution are somewhat similar. All right, but the clearance of the flumazenil and the half-life make, make your uh, end result a situation that if you give it, knowing that you had a huge dose of Versed or Benzos on board before, you may have to check in on the patient later on. Stacy, what is a therapeutic index? So, what's another way to say that? So it, here's the way I look at it. It is, in my eyes, the LD50, the distance between the LD50 and the ED50. And that's probably, I think, that's what you said. So that distance. Now look at flumazenil when given by itself. It's a very, very safe drug. And look at midazolam compared to your other induction agents. It's a very safe drug. Very safe drug. And I hope you're focusing on what I'm saying per slide because that's where your expectations are surrounding. We talked about the issue with uh, giving benzodiaz or giving flumazenil to alcoholics. <coughs> now let's flip the script and give benzodiazepines to alcoholics. Do you decrease that safety profile of your midazolam? Yes, because the alcohol and the midazolam are going to amplify the effects of each other. Is that only the same as acutely That's if they're acutely intoxicated, correct. Which, okay, there's the point. Does your macro up or down with chronic alcoholism and your sober? It does. The macro up or down if you're acutely intoxicated. Goes down. Good. So you said the Caesar, say that one more time about the Caesar threshold and the human chronic, please. No, Mac, not Caesar threshold. Did you say something about the Caesar threshold? Seizure threshold, no, that was uh, just in relation to, do you change seizure threshold normally if you give flumazenil? No, not by itself. In patients that are alcoholic, I can't say the same thing. In patients that are chronic benzos, I can't say the same thing. In fact, I'm not certain what happens in the seizure threshold. Just a stupid question. Is alcohol lift on a gamma? Alcohol, has, uh, it works on a site, it does work on the GABA receptor, and it may have its own um, modulatory site 
it, in fact, it does have its own modulatory site that is very similar in the effect that midazolam has, the allosteric type of function. But yes, it does work on the GABA site. <coughs> so, so you say that um, acute alcohol Acute, yes. Yep. All right, so now let's think about giving. Let's, let's stop. We're stopping talking about flumazenil, right? What is the point with flumazenil? It's safe. It's safe. Large therapeutic index. Large, large period therapeutic index. But what is your clinical concern? The half life is different than the half. It doesn't match up with that of midazolam. All right. So now we're done talking about that. Now let's talk about benzodiazepine overdose. And on this slide, it's saying that it takes a bunch, a crap ton, if you will, of benzodiazepines to make someone overdose. Okay, got it. But that crap ton goes down to a ton if I give them alcohol. Maybe half a ton. <coughs> now, dependence. Think about this situation. You're taking benzodiazepines every day. And what happens to your GABA receptors? They begin to downregulate. And what do we know the function of our GABA receptors for our CNS? Do they put the brakes on or do they turn the gas on? So they're responsible for putting the brakes on your central nervous system. But then what do you do? You take all of these benzodiazepines you start to downregulate your receptors, so you have fewer and fewer of them. You have less breaks. Now your brain starts to go faster and faster. Can you see now by withdrawing these benzodiazepines acutely, where you could put someone into a seizure tendency? Do I have any questions on medazolam, your prototypical benzodiazepine? Where's it metabolized? Good. What color is its label? Orange. Nice. Yes? If you can take enough of it, yeah, you'll stop breathing and you'll die of respiratory infection. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about our induction agents. And one of the most important drugs that you may use is propofol. But there are occasions when you don't have it, then you might use some accommodate. It's got its own concerns. And then, if you're like me, you'll love ketamine but maybe not by itself. Why are we giving these induction agents? To combat everything we just learned about inhalational agents, because they <laughs> suck at putting patients to sleep, right? We need to get patients through what stage of anesthesia quickly? Two. Stage two. So we give an <laughs> induction dose of these drugs and they go to sleep within one arm of the brain circulation time, which is anywhere between 15 and 20 seconds. So we have etomidate here, also known as evomidate. So that's one side effect that you should probably get no problem. It is the tendency to cause nausea and vomit. Now, this drug, like the barbiturates, right? This drug, like the barbiturates, Change your slides here. All these books are wrong. It's a weak acid, formulated as a base. But one of the problems is it's emulsified in what? Antifreeze. Antifreeze. And what happens when you inject that? It hurts. Who here has used accommodate? Why do you think you were using it compared to propofol? It's claim to fame. If I give 
midazolam, or I'm sorry, if I give propofol at its induction dose, two milligrams per kilogram, I give all of it, I don't titrate it, or I give all of my etominate at its induction dose, anywhere between 0.2 and 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, at equipotent doses, etomidate will maintain blood pressure and hemodynamics better than propofol. That is its claim to fame. It also has less ventilatory depression versus your propofol, but not less than ketamine. So what's its claim to fame? Hemodynamic stability. stability, which would make it good in what situations? Trauma, old people, cardiac cripples. <coughs> so like many of your other drugs, this is going to come as a racemic mixture. And it's metabolized in the liver by ester hydrolysis, but in the tissues of the liver, the esters that are in the tissues. You have pseudocolon esterase, you have true colon esterase, but you also have what's called tissue esterases that aren't necessarily pseudocolon esterase or acetylcholine esterase. You can be an esterase and not be one of those two. That's just a point I wanted to make. So in the liver, with these esterases, this gets metabolized. It also has uh, a pretty good volume of distribution. So knowing that the liver is going to chew it up pretty quickly and that it's got a pretty good volume of distribution, do you think you will wake up fairly quickly after an induction dose? Yes. Now what does this third bullet tell you about liver failure patients? <coughs> Well, so you get these liver failure patients, and what can't they create? Albumin, proteins. And what helps to buffer free fractions of drugs in, pro in, in plasma? Proteins. So if the plasma protein can't bind this etomidate, and it's lipophilic, it's going to find its way to compartments and tissues, doubling the volume of distribution. <clears throat> because three quarters of it will stay bound to plasma proteins. So this will activate the GABA receptor. It's not going to be on the barbiturate site. It appears that propofol and etomidate have a site that is different than thiopental. And flumazenil will not reverse the effects. So, what does that mean to you? You give it, you gotta wait till it's and what does it not compete with? <clears throat> Benzodiazepines, right? It doesn't compete for the same <coughs> site. So you can see where you can give the benzodiazepine, the midazolam, free operatively. And maybe, probably now, you need less accommodate to induce the patient, or less growth for that now. So again, my lovely crowd was like so into this PowerPoint when I first came in lovely. <laughs> so you put the propofol, the accommodate, into the IV, goes to the right atrium, right ventricle, up to the lungs finds its way back to the heart, out the aorta, finds its way to your sites of action. And it's going to hyperpolarize membranes, and the next thing you know, you're asleep. I'm trying to see if there's anything up here that should be surprising to you. It has no anti nociceptive properties. Well, it doesn't cause an increase in your pain response. It doesn't cause a decrease in your pain response. It'll reduce your intraocular pressure, of course. It's a GABA urgic agent. And interestingly, 
it can reduce cerebral blood flow and CMRO2 without necessarily changing the uh, mean arterial pressure. It doesn't have the effect in blunting the baroreceptor that many, <coughs> or that propofol does, for example. Ketamine will actually increase cardiac parameters. Propofol will decrease cardiac parameters. And accommodate will maintain cardiac parameters. The GABAergic effects of the drug, you could see how that would decrease CMRO2. Okay? Now, if CMRO2 changes, have you learned about metabolic washout yet? When you're, the reason you prefer to fuse your coronary arteries, for example, is because what do you chew up? You chew up ATP, right? And your ADP, ATP ratio changes. And what's a component of ATP, for example? Adenosine. What does adenosine do when it's liberated from ATP? But it's a vasodilator. So if you can stop energy use in the brain, you're going to decrease blood flow to those areas. But it doesn't seem that the effects of the GABA on the brain necessarily correlate to the circulatory system, where they seem to maintain, at least peripherally, mean arterial pressure. That's the best answer I can give you on that one. So you start to give this, you're going to see that the tidal volume is going to decrease. The rate will increase up to a point, and then they'll become apneic. Okay. You can understand how activating a GABAergic channel or a GABA channel can decrease your responsiveness to CO2 if you hyperpolarize the respiratory centers. Of course, you're going to be less responsive to CO2 levels. You might see this phenomenon, and you might even see it with midazolam, where they get hiccups. Have you all seen that? You give it, and they get these hiccups, and you don't know where it's coming from. So there may be some interruption between some of the motor nerves to the diaphragm. So what's its claim to fame for accommodating? I wonder if that's going to be a question. I just wonder. It does not appear to affect or attenuate the baroreceptor reflex. It seems to maintain cardiovascular parameters in those that are compromised. It will inhibit your P450 system. So what does that mean? It will extend the life of other drugs that are acted on by the P450 <coughs> system. Now, its other claim to fame, at least this in a negative context, is the inhibition of the adrenal cortex. And so, if you hear 11, 11 beta hydroxylase in your dreams, you should picture a vial of atomidate right beside it. Because atomidate apparently has a long-term suppression of that enzyme and others that are responsible for steroidogenesis. Okay? And so if you give this drug, especially over time, what can you now envision may happen to this patient? So low cortisol, so hypochronic hypertension. Their stress responses are plenty. And if you are a compromised patient already, you may, you may not be able to take that additional suppression of your adrenal cortex. And here is the pathway simplified for steroidogenesis, very simplified. But what's the point? The 11 beta hydroxylase is what makes your cortisol, right? And your corticosterone. They actually had a study comparing, I think it was midazolam to etomidate in ICU sedation. And they had to actually stop the study 
because their interim analyses were finding that the ICU patients receiving these long-term infusions were dying, up to 53% increase in mortality. And the reason they were dying is because their stress response was blunted. We may or may not get to a slide set, depending on how we do today, in reference to malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is associated with this block because all of your inhaled agents can trigger malignant hyperthermia. These are not inhaled agents. These are IV agents. They will not trigger malignant hyperthermia. You have a patient that has a familial history of MH. It is safe to give them propofol. It is safe to give them ketamine. It is safe to give them etomidate. It would not be safe to give them succinylcholine. It would not be safe to give them isoflurane. It would not be safe to give them sevoflurane, desflurane. But it would be safe to give them nitrous oxide. So now, hopefully we'll get there. We talked about porphyria with sodium thiopental. Etomidate appears to have the same problem. So patients that have AIP, this is relatively contraindicated. This drug is safe for patients with reactive airway disease. It does not release histamine, as many of the drugs that we seem to give do. It may have this um, frightening effect for you when you first give it to some patients. You give the bolus and they may start to flap their arms around or kick their leg. That's called myoclonus. It's an involuntary movement and it's a result of GABA stimulation <coughs> within the motor system. And the reason it's called evomidate is because it makes people vomit. This, yeah? Does it make people vomit like immediately, or is it something that they wake up from? Yes, when they wake up, post doctor nausea. This will hurt when it's injected. So, some of the techniques to make these drugs that hurt when they're injected, to make them hurt less, give it into a large vein. So is that going to happen in anesthesia? No. What happens? Your pre-op nurses, they put that 20 gauge in, in the hand, and you start to give your drug, and it starts burning up their whole arm. And you're like, great. That's the last thing my patient's going to remember. It's awesome. <laughs> so I give five versets, so they won't even care. <laughs> But also, I give lidocaine. I give 100 milligrams of lidocaine prior to my induction for other reasons. But part of it is to numb up that vessel and make it hurt less. You can also use opioid to make it hurt less. I, start, I, I had surgery, and I was like, the anesthesiologist was giving me propofol, which kind of like that makes sense. Jesus Christ, that really hurt. And I was gone. So You're like, gone. what's the point? The line. I mean, they're about to take a knife and have it open anyway. So. But think about anesthesia, right? At least in a civilian world. Not lawsuits. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Oh. <laughs> I hit you. But surgeons don't want. You are, you're catering to the surgeons, so you need to create the Rolls Royce of anesthesia, right? <laughs> so some of these things that we learn about aren't necessarily dangerous, they're just problematic when it comes to profit margin. Yeah. What's the difference between myoclonus and defasciculation? Defasciculation is mediated at the motor end point. Myoclonus is mediated central. And defasciculation is more of a convulsive type of movement. <laughs> so what's a good candidate for patients to receive etomidate? Cardiac, Cardiac cripples, trauma. Right? 
Old people. You're in the ER. That's always one. Uh, it depends. In the ER, they use it all the time. In the OR, I use it a handful of times. No, not in the ICU at all. Yeah. RSI. 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 And why are they? So here, let me let me tell you how why they're doing this. Because if you are doing an RSI in the <coughs> ER, you're not taking the time to look at the patient's hemodynamics and how they're responding. All you're thinking is tube in hole, tube in hole, right? So the doc comes in and it may not be an anesthetist. And next time, look at who the anesthetist is when they go in and if they actually select propofol or select atomidate or nothing at all. If I walk in and the patient's not responding to me, it's metal nephrin all day long, right? <laughs> if, if I walk in and the patient's combative, and the patient's combative, I can use either, or, or if the patient's not combative, I can use either etomidate or propofol. <coughs> but the point here is, those guys in the ER are given the entire bolus, regardless if you hand them a white syringe or a clear syringe. They're pushing the entire thing. That's why you see that significant drop in, hypo, in, in hemodynamics with propofol, because you gave the entire thing. I probably would give half of the propofol and get the same effect. Right? So that's why you see it with RSIs, with people who don't appreciate the fact that you can titrate a dose for an RSI. You don't have to get the whole thing. Um, if you cannot maintain a pressure anyway, they're probably not talking to you. But yeah. And then they get metal up. Then their pressure goes up. Right? You put that cold steel on their epiglottis, and that is a nice sympathetic stimulation. But I hear what you're saying. If I've got somebody who's borderline, maybe. Maybe I use it. Or maybe I'll just use 5 cc's of propofol. But that's me. The answer for you walking into that situation, accommodate your first choice because has cardiovascular stability. But as you grow in your career and you get more comfortable with the other drugs, you may change your mind. Does that make sense? Cardioversion, you can use whatever you want. I just don't like to accommodate because of that adrenal suppression. I'm a believer. Even a, even a one-time dose, I believe that it can change maybe not mortality, but definitely morbidity. You know? Patients get sicker, they stay sicker longer. I'm speculating there, but that's that's one of those things that I actually I don't I have only got a couple articles that support my hypothesis, but that's a couple more than the other side has. And so I would just prefer to use propofol because it seems to be a better drug. Now the other time I'll use accommodate is when you have a patient that's allergic to egg yolks. We'll learn about that here soon. <coughs> then that's what propofol is made out of. So propofol, great questions by the way, propofol, also known as diprovan, and now you know why. D-I-P-R-I-V-A-N. Diprovan. 2,6-diacetylpropofenol. So they took the dye. PR from the probe, right? And then it's yeah, IV anesthesia, so it's different. Mm -hmm. Anyone here ever used the Fresnius, Fre Fresenius propofol? It works just like, this is the European version, this is the American version. And when propofol was short, it uh, was quite popular because you could get it a lot easier. So this drug, propofol, is made up of soybean, soybean oil, oil, so if you have an allergy to soy, you have to be careful, egg yolk, glycerol, right? This milk of amnesia is a rapid onset drug marketed as a 1% emulsion. It's a 1% lipid.
Yeah, uh, we have a chart coming up too. So when you inject this drug, most of it, if not all of it, is non-ionized, meaning what? It's an extremely fast onset. But it redistributes quickly, so it has an extremely fast offset. It's metabolized by the liver, and it could actually be filtered in part a little bit by the lung. And you may read that propofol has extra hepatic metabolism. So A, it is broken down by the liver, no doubt. But in the lung, there may be some metabolic pathways there as well. And because it's so lipophilic, can molecules of propofol find their way into the alveolus, and can you expire them? Absolutely. Just like you can, you can measure expired or expired concentrations of fentanyl, just like you can measure expired concentrations of etanolate. Any lipophilic drug can find its way to the lung. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the liver, the point there is that the liver will pull out a lot of this propofol from the blood, but the extraction ratio of that liver, it doesn't account for the rapid termination of the drug, so there has to be other mechanisms in play. So the lung extrahepatic <coughs> metabolism, uh, the redistribution. <clears throat> I wonder how many times I can say that the lung has a has a has is a player in the metabolism of propofol. And again, the end tidal concentrations can be measured. Because of propofol and the fact that they were using it intravenously for long times, a new parameter came up that every anesthesia student has to learn now. Contact sensitive half times. And the contact sensitive half time is the time that it clears from the central compartment. What do you think that central compartment basically is? Blood. The blood. Right? The blood. So you, for your purposes, can relate this to a 50% reduction of concentrations of propofol or any other drug that you're looking at from the bloodstream. And how do you measure it? Well, you look at the length that the drug was infused. And then you're going to see that chart that's going to come up again. After an hour and a half, for example, it'll have an intersection on the y-axis to say it took this amount of minutes to <coughs> decrease my blood concentration by 50%. In fact, here's that slide. And what is presented to you in the red for propofol is the therapeutic range. So, what is your therapeutic effect, Benjamin, with propofol that you want? You, why do you give propofol? Uh, Say it, right? To induce a patient. So, the criteria for induction will be maintained from time of bolus until it's out of this red mark, at least on this picture. Does that make sense to everybody? The criteria for induction is going to stay met from the time of the bolus until it falls out of that therapeutic range. And according to this chart, when you bolus propofol, how long can you expect your therapeutic effect to last? Eight minutes is the number I would put in my head if I were you. Expect your patient to wake up in eight minutes. Now, just as an aside, and I'm going to probably say this three or four times throughout the year, when you're doing a rapid sequence induction, kind of off topic, but I think you'll enjoy it. When you're doing a rapid sequence induction, you're trying to get airway security quickly, right? And what you probably used Propofol before or Atomidate. Atomidate lasts about <coughs> 10 minutes. 
and you use succinylcholine, correct? How long do you think a bolus of succinylcholine will last? Two to three minutes if you give low dose. Five to ten minutes, maybe eight-ish, if you give a higher dose, the higher end of the dose. So what does that tell you that if you have a hard time getting the airway? If you can make it that eight to ten minutes, they're going to start breathing again. And so you're trying to mirror up the clinical effects of both. And if you've properly pre-oxygenated for three to five minutes, in the average patient, the normal patient, you can have a period of apnea up to 10 minutes without desaturation. Usually it's about six minutes. But what, what does that tell you? By using a short-acting induction agent and a short-acting neuromuscular blocker in conjunction, and you go to intubate, you haven't burned a bridge as long as you've adequately pre-oxygenated. Remember this when you go to the floor. One of your most important things when you're called to the floor when you intubate isn't the drugs you give. Because you can give, you can give a short acting and accommodate and it sucks. It's going to be that pre-oxygenation. If the patient can tolerate it, have them pre-oxygenate a little bit before you do your induction. That way, if you get into a little trouble, you know, at least they won't be set as quickly. Now back on target. So this slide, I probably would be prepared to look at the induction agents, right? The thiopental, the propofol, the midazolam, because it can be used for induction. And be prepared to read this, this graph. And again, you just have to look at the hours of infusion. So if we give midazolam for eight hours, how long until 50% of that drug should leave our central compartment? It looks like it's about an hour, a little bit over an hour. So just be prepared to read that. If you can't read that graph, this is just a bar chart of what was just said. If you want to just nix this slide, you can go ahead and do that too. And this slide. I must have really wanted to stress this point with you. But what do you know? What do you see about propofol? <coughs> Still turn it off. You can still turn it off, and you're going to see that central clearance within 40, 30, 40 minutes. That's why it's very nice for Tiva. I got, I got my propofol here again. There comes the chloride, and we're hyperpolarized. If you miss that, you're going to be upset. All right, where does propofol work? It does have a site, and they think, they think it's at the beta-1 subunit. Maybe at the beta-1 subunit. And it also has something else it does, at least it appears to do, and that is blocking or inhibiting the NMDA receptor. Maybe not very potent in doing that, but it does appear that it has some NMDA receptor blockade potential. When you take a liposome with a receptor formulation and you put it in a Petri dish and you put it in the lab, in vitro, in the lab, and you apply the propofol, it may inhibit calcium flux as well. <coughs> if you can tell me that GABA is activated and it may inhibit NMDA receptors, I'm good with that. Don't be surprised if you give this to a man or a woman, and let's imagine that you've given them a little bit of Versed preoperatively, and the next thing you hear is how they want to do certain things with you, and just go, uh-huh, and titrate the conversation. The more, they talk, the more they talk, the more you give. 
Don't be surprised if you give a bolus of propofol and they arch up on their back and their neck. That's called epistotonos. Propofol is a good anticonvulsant. It will break a seizure. It will decrease ICP. It is a GABAergic agent. It will maintain the CO2 response better than the accommodate will. And what do I mean by that in the brain? So it better maintains the CO2 response in the brain versus accommodate. This when the CO2 rises, it causes you to breathe? Well, the CO2 rises, it will change blood pattern, blood flow patterns. This is with that linear, as CO2 rises, cerebral blood flow increases. So it'll better maintain that. It'll reduce CMRO2. But what is the point of the induction agents when it comes to, I mean, that's kind of a trivial matter, but what's the big picture point with the induction agents and CMRO2 and cerebral blood flow? They decrease cerebral blood flow, they decrease CMRO2. They're neuroprotective. Is thiopental neuroprotective? It is, right? It has a similar pattern in the respiratory parameters as uh, etomidate. If you give a little bit of it, you're going to see the respiratory rate increase, and then you give a lot more of it, and they become active. This is a good, um, it appears that this drug could help you in the event of a bronchospasm. It also appears that this drug has good laryngeal muscle relaxation. When would that be ideal for you guys? Laryngospasm. Um, but what device do you put in the larynx and not through the trachea? The LMA. So LMA placement might be optimized with the use of propofol. So you all learned how propofol was the devil. And when you gave propofol, blood pressure dropped. I agree. If you give a full induction dose, blood pressure is going to drop. It's going to drop. So you give two to two and a half milligrams per kilogram, you're going to see anywhere between a 20 and a 40 percent drop in your cardiovascular parameters. Now, why do you think you why do you think that happens more than the comedy? This is going to be probably a test question here. And you've probably got my pattern yet when I'm talking on my slides. I'm up to this point right here. So the baroreceptor mechanism appears to be blunted more readily by propofol. How will blocking the baroreceptor inhibit the body's ability to maintain blood pressure? So if you vasodilate, what usually happens to your heart rate? It increases. It increases. But the cardiovascular center appears to be blunted by propofol more than other induction agents. So you don't see that rebound tachycardia, and now your blood pressure falls. Your induction agents won't potentiate your neuromuscular blockade. They just don't last long enough to do that. Propofol is safe to use an MH, but if you are allergic to eggs, you might want to consider using Accommodate for ketamine. Now, if you get the European version of Propofol, you also have to make sure they're not allergic to any kind of nuts, because the European version of Propofol adds not only the lecithin, but the oleic acid, which is a nut component. 
Yeah, there's that whole bullet I just talked about, about the laryngeal and the pharyngeal musculature. Yes, sir. Did you say on the previous slide that my doctor said bronchospasm? Yeah. But then it also said that there's a bronchospasm. Look at what this bullet is saying. Oh, tracking, tracking, sorry, sir. It's preservative or the anaphylactic reaction if it happens because of the egg allergy. But the actual <coughs> drug itself, not the formulations in the drug, but the actual molecule itself activating that GABA receptor. And so here's <coughs> that chart that compares propoven to propofol. Propofol is in America, and propoven is what you can buy from overseas. And the only reason I'm stressing this is because this is being used now. You may see it, especially if you have shortages. Take a break, come back at two. Michael Jackson would just speak. Yes, like you need more. You can call it. It's so fun. It was It was so fight. It's so fake. So, are you really okay, so a so okay. I'm just curious about the Yeah, it's a Yeah, it's it's like when the check engine the sorry, you can always use this test the pharmacy as a like a like a phone Oh no, if I just needed it, like I could call and say, and it broke all my it's not a controlled substance, so realistically, if you can pay for it, you can buy it. Now, Not at the moment. Not at the moment. But it comes and goes. You see, you see a little bit of production in the trash. Um, and I a lot of times we get a lot of medications. The bachelor party was hilarious. They're not priced like for an hour, priced for five hours. So, yeah. What can I do with the bite of the Pharmacy. So then you get 10 cc syringes or whatever. 
that's smart. Right. Well, I'm smart. Right. I'll take 100 and divide it five ways. We can do that. Yeah, 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 we can do I think austere environments work right, because especially, especially when you've got a med surge nurse that has a family practice talking. Yeah. yeah, and you have to intubate somebody. It's not going to. That's the soldier you need to or whatever, and they're, they're not the patients that really are affected by their disease. True, yeah, because they're all locked up. <laughs> even, though they're, even though they have drama, they're still healthier. You know, their organs are still healthier at that moment than someone here. It's, it's pretty septic or something. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So, think about your economics. Think about your transportability. Think about a bottle of vapor. You're going to get more bang for your buck for your bottle of vapor. The gas in the jar. And think about the footprint. Think about the storage conditions of the perfect ball. Uh, now, I agree, Tiva is a great thing downrange. Mm. But I would use, per se, Academy. Uh, you got a way of putting it. If you're going with, you're going with small group, Tiva is the way to go. You know, small small team, JSOC, Tiva definitely the way to go. If you're going with a cash, you can know, take whatever you want. Right. You can pack it all in there and go. Yeah. So they have twin special operations CRNs? Absolutely. You have to be recruited for it, but there's definitely JSOC CRNs. So you have to have a lot of, a lot of experience. Not necessarily. Buddy of mine is a new, buddy of mine is actually the JSOC uh, commander right now. Anybody know Brad Wheeland? Or uh, Brad Morgan? Colonel Morgan? No? You know him? If you want to go JSOC, he's the guy to talk to. <laughs> the problem with JSOC is you don't really do anesthesia when you're gone. You do minimal, minimal anesthesia. Huh? You're doing uh, more resuscitation or. Uh, yeah, it's different. Okay, here we go, moving forward. One minute? Oh, okay, I'll let him walk through. Noisy 
That's dangerous. Cricket noises after lunch, two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> So teaching on the windows makes it look like it's getting done in front of class. We just get hosed, don't I? Get all the late classes. I teach all the freaking stuff you know, want to hear about. Oh, this is actually no, awesome. no, no. Oh, this is good. No, this, yes, but it's, 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 it's like stats in the afternoon. That's all oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It should be. It should be this never. All right, me. Seriously, why are there crickets? I don't know. I don't know. Is it? Is this also his phone or? Is the great cricket hunter. Oh, he's just oh. He's close. <laughs> <laughs> he's close. Get it. I'm laughing at you. Can't wait for the game to start. So I wonder if they. Oh no! Okay, here we go. So a nice trick. If you're if you getting ready to go to the pack, you or if you're to have a patient in the pack you and they get nauseous. One or two cc's of propofol is nice because it usually will take away the nausea. <coughs> yep. So like the atomidate, propofol hurts. So the same maneuvers to decrease pain on injection apply. We've talked about the fact that it drops hemodynamic parameters, so it makes sense that you would use caution in those patients that may be compromised cardiovascularly, extremes of age, debilitated patients. Now, this is something I never understood. You can have propofol in a line for 12 hours but you can only have it in a syringe for six. What's the difference if I've got a cap and everything else? Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, because it is a lipid, it will support bacterial growth. And there have been reports of bacterial growth that has been injected and caused uh, Septicemia in patients. Has anyone here ever seen propofol infusion syndrome? It's a green pea. Okay. And so the fat that is in this propofol, the lipid emulsion, may play a part in this because they're long chain triglycerides. And so metabolizing that fat creates a condition where, what, what, what did you see in this condition? Green pea. Well, what else? Well, what else do they get? Like hypertriglycerides. Yeah. yeah. They get acidotic, acidotic? They do. They get acidotic. Absolutely. No one knows why it happens. At least not for certain. But it appears to be this metabolic disruption from the lipids. And that's propofol. And you get a hour instruction block on propofol, and you're going to use it probably 95% of the time. Okay. What do you know that it does? It induces patients by acting on the GABA receptor. You can't give it if there's an egg yolk allergy. You've got to be careful with nuts with propofol. I mean, those main points. And then the other stuff comes with time, like how much to give in certain conditions. You're not going to know that. You've got to have you know the big skeleton items here, the big framework items. Ketamine, my favorite drug. If I had one drug to take with me, downrange, it would be ketamine. All right? You can get everything you need with ketamine. But if you give it to a patient, and they receive it by itself, it will mess you up. 
at least at that point in time, because it is, it, what is it related to? PCP, LSD, it's a phencyclidine. So it's going to, in high doses, by itself, I keep stressing that, because what should you always give with this? A benzodiazepine or a GABAergic agent like propofol or like etomidine. But by itself, man, you see some funny colors. So what about the NMDA receptor? This is the N-methyl-D aspartate receptor and glutamate, you know, as the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Glutamate is always considered to be the agonist for this receptor, and that's true, but there is also a coagonist that is required for the activation of this receptor. And that coagonist is glycine. So both glycine and glutamate have to be bound to the NMDA receptor for it to partially open. Partially open? What are you talking about, sir? Well, you'll see here in a second. It partially opens when the glycine and the glutamate both bind, but you still have magnesium in the way. So the only thing that this receptor is doing right now is allowing sodium in, and potassium out. <clears throat> That's the ligand effect of this receptor. But it is one of the few receptors in the body, one of the only ones I can think of at the moment, that is both ligand gated and voltage gated. Does anyone have an idea of what kind of things NMDA are involved with, NMDA receptors? Pain, memory. So activation of your NMDA receptors, chronic activation of your NMDA receptors is responsible for forming memories in the brain. But if you form a memory in your spinal cord, you're going to facilitate pain transmission. We'll get to that too. But in order for that to happen, you have to have a painful enough stimulus that you continually bombard the NMDA receptor with glutamate and glycine, and you continually allow sodium to influx inside of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And when all of this positive ion comes inside the cytosol, what happens to the voltage inside of that cytosol? It changes, it depolarizes. And when that voltage reaches a certain voltage, it kicks off that magnesium. So with a sufficient stimulus, you get both ligand opening and voltage opening of this channel. Now when that magnesium pops off, there's room for another ion to flow through that channel. And that's calcium. And when calcium flows into nervous tissue, it creates all kinds of stuff. It strengthens synapses. It creates these new uh, enzymes, new genes. If you strengthen a synapse in the brain, that's good because you make memories. But if you strengthen a synapse in a pain pathway, that's bad. Okay. <clears throat> so we get ketamine and we block the interior of this channel. So ketamine works on the inside of the NMDA receptor. So not only can, can you see now how it can make you forget things in the brain, because the NMDA receptor is required for memory and take away your pain in the spinal cord and also inhibit wind-up or that phenomenon of having pain extend beyond the procedure. So this has been around for a while and you're going to have, if you ever talk to a vet, a vet will tell you that it has absolutely no 
analgesic properties. And then you'll say, oh, yes, it does. In humans, it's a potent analgesic. But they do look a little funny when you give it to patients. They get this stare, and it looks like they're awake, but they're not really awake. And you're doing surgery on them. They're breathing on their own, looking up at you, but not really caring what's happening. Mm -hmm. So if you can cut off the messages arriving to the brain, where is your relay station at? Thalamus. The thalamus. So you create what's called a chemical thalamectomy. And what I described is a patient that appears dissociated from the environment. It's a potent analgesic in humans. I don't know what it does in animals, but it is a potent analgesic in humans. So there's two isomers to this ketamine mixture, the sinister <coughs> isomer and the rectus isomer. And as always, usually, the S isomer gives you your better effects with less side effects. But this is still made typically as a racemic mixture because it is expensive to remove the S isomer. I wish they could though. It has a very it has a pretty high volume of distribution. It's lipid soluble. It's metabolized by the P450 system. So what will that do to other drugs that are metabolized by that system? Compete for the enzymes and increase the duration of both drugs. Um, the type of blockade it creates is a non-competitive blockade, meaning what? Nope, it doesn't, it's not competing for the active site. So the molecules that actually open up the receptor can still find their way to the active site, but no matter how much glutamate or glycine you give, if you've got ketamine in the way, you can't overcome the ketamine blockade. It's not competitive. It's not competing for the same site. Does that just make an allosteric concert? Uh, it's an allosteric inhibitor. So we talked about its chemical thalmectomy, creating the state of anhedonia, the fact that I don't care, I have no pleasure, um, I'm just here while you cut on my belly. Great. It's going to in interfere with the reticular formation, no doubt. It shouldn't be a surprise that it acts at these sites. Right? It shouldn't be surprising that it acts at the reticular formation. It shouldn't be surprising that it acts at the hippocampus. It shouldn't be surprising that it acts in the spinal cord, because that's what it's supposed to do. One of the things that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is wind-up. Ketamine will inhibit wind-up. And you may actually have heard of this used as a preemptive analgesic in surgery. You give it prior to the cut, you might have less pain after the procedure. You give it preemptively and have less pain, hopefully, afterwards. Now, it may bind to some opioid receptors, and it may bind to the sigma receptor. When it comes to a state of um, consciousness or feeling, these sigma receptors, when they're activated, they will make you feel terrible. They'll make you feel dysphoric. Uh, you may have some hallucinations. But if you give a drug in a clinical dose or a therapeutic dose, do you think that, what's the, what's the place I'm looking at? If you give the right amount of drug to get your clinical effect, then you have less side effects. Why? Because you're not oversaturating the receptors, thereby allowing the molecule to find other receptors to play with. Does that make sense? So if, if you give the drug in the right concentration, you're not going to see these cognitive issues with ketamine. 
My advice to you is don't give more than a milligram per kilogram. Make sure you're using a benzodiazepine with it or a gabaergic agent. Now, ketamine is different than propofol, different from metomidate in regards to cardiovascular parameters, parameters and cerebral parameters. Ketamine will increase your cardiac output. Ketamine will increase your heart rate. Does anyone know why? It's the United States catecholamine release. It does. It stimulates indirectly catecholamine release out of nerve terminals. And what catecholamine is that? That's found in nerve terminals. Nerve terminals. Norepinephrine. So it causes the release of norepinephrine. And what do you know that norepinephrine does? Vasoconstricts tachycardia. And then over time, uh, within a couple of minutes, if you're stimulating the release of vesicles from nerve terminals, eventually epinephrine will get released. And guess what ketamine is ultimately? It's a great bronchodilator. So patients with asthma, probably a good choice. Patients, trauma patients, probably a good choice for the maintenance of the cardiovascular parameters, right? Head injury patients, not so much. It's going to increase CMRO2. It's going to increase cerebral blood flow. It's going to increase ICP. It may actually have some electrogenic effects. So good for trauma, bad for neuro. Dr. Bentley. Yeah. For telling off that trauma, we had a rather cantankerous anesthesiologist in Kandahar who just like refused to let us give ketamine to trauma patients. He uh -huh. said that there was concern that their catecholamine depleted because of the trauma state. Okay, so I'm going to get in there. Okay. So ketamine indirectly increases <coughs> the, the release of catecholamines. But catecholamines are made when you're not stressed. They're made... Um, in the nerve terminals, and they have to be released. But if you're chronically stressed over time, what do you continue to release? Catecholamine. You're continually stressed over and over again. And so this, I will say it's a theoretical concern that if you're laying out in the field and the sun's baking down on you and you're shot in the leg and it's been three days, then yeah, maybe I'm not going to use uh, ketamine for this. Why? Because ketamine in the laboratory, directly applied to cardiac muscle, its move muscle, is a depressant. So, the, but you're right. The board question that will be asked is you have a sympathetically depleted, a catecholamine depleted patient, and you give ketamine, what might you see? You might see a drop in blood pressure. You might see a decrease in heart rate. You might see decompensation in that regard. I'm going to tell you, I've never ever seen that. So, yeah, um, when we were we were giving it to our trauma guys and in flight, uh, they would actually flatline. Uh, really? Yeah, if it was a massive trauma, like a like a double amp or a triple amp. Uh, we we hit them with ketamine as an induction dose, and they would flatline. Why do you think they flatline? I thought it was because they were so stimulated from the trauma that we gave them the basically the way to relax, and everything just relaxed. And if you give a dose of ketamine and you abruptly increase norepinephrine release, did blood pressure go up? No. It didn't it was, go up. It was going to go up initially. I think they were dropping down. I couldn't tell blood pressure anyway. Just think about the baroreceptor. My first thought about that was this is a fresh trauma, right? It just happened that day, and these are young guys. Mm -hmm. This wasn't. This wasn't a cat. This was a catecholamine problem, but there was too much catecholamine in my mind. You had such a release of cat. Like how much were you giving? Uh I want to say we were doing three per kilo. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. Two or three. 
So you give this, and now think about norepinephrine release. Think about vasoconstriction. What happens to heart rate when you vasoconstrict? It decreases. Sometimes in some young patients that are very vagal, you're going to see these young soldiers flatline all the time for 10 to 12 seconds that get very vagal. My initial impression is that's what happened with you guys. Yes? Did he come back? He did. Um, but now, what was it a function of, of us actually starting CPR and shocking the guy? I don't know, but um, it, both, all three times that it happened, they, they were they young they, soldiers? Two were young soldiers, and one was a younger 30s athlete. Not surprising. I'm not surprised by that. I've seen the two at the same time. They're taking away circuitous control and they're intubating and giving them an induction dose and they bite. Well, that's what that's what last little bird. Accommodate, propol. Anybody can do that. Yeah. So, you know, we can't always predict that we're just one of that. So it was it was like not just um, with me. Maybe yeah, I'd have to see. There's a lot of variables there that you have right. to account for. Initially, to me, young guy, healthy guy, I'm thinking, man, did you. You probably saw his heart rate going 40, 30, 20, and then it dropped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, to me, that's a vagal, vagal down episode. So this, I call it vagal down, right? So what happens when the norepinephrine comes out? It constricts the blood vessels, and you get a vagal response, right? That To me, that's what it's setting up. I can't say that for sure. All right, so it's great for asthmatics. Great for asthmatics. Okay. Also, if it releases catecholamines, you know that when you have an anaphylactic reaction, that you give epinephrine, right? Well, ketamine eventually releases epinephrine, so it should <coughs> help stabilize some mast cells. And mast cells release histamine. So you could attenuate some of the histamine responses. I'm not saying that it's always going to work, but when all else fails, consider ketamine. One of the claims to fame of ketamine is that patients typically, when given this, will maintain their ventilations. There is a relative protection of the airway reflexes, but you cannot guarantee that with the use of ketamine. You have a relative preservation of the airway reflex. So we've, we've nailed that the fact that ketamine is going to increase your cardiovascular parameters. And now on slide 124, here comes that catecholamine issue that we've just talked about. We've just talked about. So the mechanism, norepinephrine is released. And it also inhibits the reuptake of norepinephrine. Because I don't know if you've learned this yet, but what is the major termination? What is one of the major ways that norepinephrine effects are terminated? To reuptake re into the nerve terminal. So it increases the outflow and decreases the uptake. But if you've got that person who's been in the desert for five days with the sun beating down on them, and you give ketamine, you may see myocardial depression because the catecholamines are gone. Now, in regards to the cardiovascular parameters, it should make sense that if this drug increases cardiovascular parameters because of an indirect effect, that requires the synthesis and release of neurotransmitters. So I give it, the blood pressure goes up, it comes, starts coming back down. I give it again, it doesn't work as much. Why? Because you've exhausted a store, some of your catecholamine, so you can't release as much the next time around. Those meth addicts. Exactly. If you're constantly pushing out catecholamines, you're not going to. Uh, someone who takes ephedrine, rip fuel, this soldier that comes in with all the supplements, and you go to use ketamine on them, 
it may not, you may not see the effects on blood pressure like you would someone who's drug made. Yeah. Someone has CAD. I don't. See, coronary artery disease, CAD. I don't recommend that you give ketamine to them. Because if you make them tachycardic, that's bad for coronary artery disease. If you're going to induce a patient for anesthesia, you should be able to do one milligram per kilogram of ketamine and get the effect that you want. I like to use ketafol, ketamine and propofol mixed together. I like to put 50 to 100 milligrams of ketamine in 200 milligrams of propofol. It's a nice mix in my hands. In doing so, I can use less drug to induce patients and get the benefit of the cardiovascular increase with the propofol to offset the cardio or with the ketamine to offset the cardiovascular depression with the propofol. So is that something you can just mix up at the bedside or do you yes. have to buy the commercial formulation? No, you you'll pull out your ketamine, you pull out your propofol and you'll mix them together. We talked about neuro. When I say ketamine, is that a good choice for neuro? No, no. Probably not. Probably not. And if you're a pilot, you can't get ketamine through pilots in the Air Force. Okay. If someone has a psych disorder, you have to see what type of disorder it is and make a decision whether or not you want to use ketamine. Does it inhibit me from using ketamine in patients? Not if I'm using another agent like propofol. Midazolam, so on and so forth. All right, yes, sir. Why can't you use antibiotics? Because one of the problems with ketamine given by itself, especially at higher doses, if it is psych psychotic breaks like uh, night terrors, like uh, cognitive disturbance, that that far is removed from the event of giving the ketamine itself, and so if there is any type of cognitive problem with someone being stressed in a plane, they don't want to take that risk. Okay. Yes? Some of the times I've always been confused by this. We were in the ER and the child had a lab on the way to the We're talking stun dose here. And you gave him a dose of B, it was a paralytic, basically. Perfect, right? So a stun dose isn't by itself. A pediatric stun dose, in a syringe, you'll place Robinol, you'll place midazolam, or you should, and you... It was an IMJ. Yeah, I know. Ketamine will... But usually, usually you should use Robinol, midazolam, and ketamine together in a syringe and pop them in the butt, right? They become very compliant. You can do whatever you need. But what you created was that chemical thalamectomy, Right? You saw exactly what it was. He lays there. He doesn't care what's happening. Well, you couldn't move. Yeah. You have to do the suture on this. Yep. And that's what you see. Any other questions on ketamine? Thank you, sir. I've always wondered about that. Because I did it. Because we have patients that are on ketamine. So if, uh, if, if you create a chemical thalamectomy, the thalamus, you've got sensory things going through it, but do you also have motor <coughs> running down through it? Yeah. yeah, you're going to have motor components that are connected to the thalamus. And so if you disrupt that circuit, they're not going to be able to move very well at all. It, gives you the, it is the drug that gives you the most components of anesthesia, without a doubt. Huh? It will last 20 to 40 minutes. All right, here are some other formulations. Phospropofol. It's called Aquaman. And this was beginning to get some press when there was a propofol shortage. And it is a pro drug. Are you familiar with a pro drug? Correct. And so the problem with this at these GI clinics, right? There's a GI clinic down here called uh, San Antonio Gastroenterology Associates. And they are quick. They do four to five procedures an hour per room. And they probably do, they pro I remember we did probably 80 
on average a day. 80, 80 scopes or and they do this every day. So they're thinking about getting phospropofol during the shortage, right? Of propofol. Problem is, you have to actually give this as soon as they come in the room in order for it to start taking effect. It takes about three to five minutes for it to actually kick in. And that's three to five minutes that these guys don't want to wait. Right? And so that's the that's the big issue with the phospropofol. It works just like propofol, right? One milligram of this aquaman of this propofol will give you about a half a milligram of propofol after it is metabolized. But that takes a while. <coughs> Accommodate. Accommodate's great except for what? The adrenal suppression. So guess what the chemists did? They made this mock etomidate to try to stop that adrenal cortical issue. And it's successful, right? It was successful. I just haven't seen this come on the market yet. I don't know if it's FDA approved, but I do know that Evers does a good job mentioning the, good, the new drugs. And I'll get you that chapter. Um, the reason I don't post chapters is these, these are conglomerates of several chapters. But if you read Barish, if you read Stolting, if you read Evers, and you find those chapters, they're going to augment what we're doing here. PF0713. Doesn't have a name yet. It means it's probably in its uh, latter stages. This is a lipid emulsion that is a shorter acting kind of version of propofol. <coughs> Much shorter acting. Yeah, and I'm not testing you on any of these here at the end, okay? This is just a conversation. You don't have to write anything. I'm just kind of letting you know that you guys might get the opportunity to see some of these new drugs. They got this cool little drug here, this JM1232, and it has an affinity for the benzodiazepine receptor. But remember when I showed you that benzodiazepine receptor had several sites? It's not, it's not the site that midazolam has. So it's a similar acting agent, but not at the midazolam site. And this one, this one is called Remy Midazolam. I believe that's the one. Yeah. This one, CNS 7056X, Remy Midazolam, broken down by s raises and tissue. And it's a very, very short version of a benzodiazepine. Now think about the GI, the GI guys would love to get a hold of this. This one lasts three minutes, three to four minutes. So, yeah. This is another drug. Uh, the point here is when it's kind of cool to read about these new drugs um, because you know that they're at least looking. Uh, for something better. And the good thing is, at least in 20 years, when the patent comes off, if it ever comes out, it'll be cheap enough that you could actually use it for TiVo. Right? You just turn it on, turn it off. You know, better than your gases. But anyway. Last, one of the last things to talk about, I think, yeah, is allergic reactions to the drugs that you give in the IV. Do you think there's a high tendency for patients to be allergic to these drugs? No. Let's look at thiopental. I mean, that's quoted up to be 1 in 20,000 is actually allergic to the compound thiopental. Right? Brevitol, 1 in 1,600 to 1 in 7,000. It doesn't happen very often, right? Propofol, that's a weird number, 5 in 1131. <laughs> Ketamine, there's been only two cases reported. Midazolam, 17 cases reported. So it is very, very rare. The neuromuscular blocker, you'll see later, uh, it has a low tendency. So what's the point with me showing you this slide? Look for the horse before the zebra. <laughs> when you conduct a differential diagnosis, Rule out the common problem first before you consider an uncommon problem. 
look for the horses before you look for the zebra. Okay. The zebra is probably not going to be there, but a horse will be. Okay. <laughs> you, you can ride a zebra too, but usually you ride horses. All right, that's it. Have a good day. We're gonna be. I guess we're gonna be able to cover MH next time. Yes. Well, I'm here tomorrow too, right? Me? What? I need a ride. I need, what do the students need to ride for? I don't, I'm sorry. I, I need one of you to volunteer to give one of the students a ride. I've got an appointment one at 320. I'm sorry? I've got an appointment at 320. <laughs> no, not to make you afraid you can't do it, but she, I don't know. She said she lives in Cibolo. Captain Jarena needs a ride home. I'm sorry? You know where she... Oh, there you go. There's supplements and stuff. All I would see is deep down the 80s and then gone. And then, but of course, I'm not watching monitor. I'm doing a lot of to turn around and then I'm just checking these. If you were able to check the pressure, I'd be surprised. I would be I'm very surprised that there are pipers like 200 of them. Yeah. We were hitting yeah. all we could get as either radio or you know what? I guess it was for 30 systolic. Right, that's what you could. I mean, before they were in school. It would have been nice to see what's going on. Yeah. Now, when you get a question, yeah, when you're in the old house, and you have an A line in, and you get a question, watch it happen. I see it like with pain because we gave the pain, but like, like you said, that's what we came for everything. I didn't draw a single test right now unless I was doing a transport. I took out me at home. And like I would start hitting them with the ketamine, and you would see the transient rise. It is nice to see. It would go up, and the blood pressure would. It would it would go up 20%, 30% from the baseline. Yes, it does. But it only lasted for like 30 seconds. No, you're right, but see, 30 seconds for those guys? Is all you need to make them go flatline if it goes up that high. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's very basically because they're saying that they are. Well, usually, so this is what, those guys are healthy. They have a very responsive pair of mm -hmm. That's why you're young guys, that you, with you do shoulder blocks on these young guys, and you send them to the pack group, they're going to go away to stop. Oh, nice. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I'm good to tell you. I know, I know, but I, I want to tell you. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a word I've used many times before I had my son. It's just like, you know, it's a better word. Okay, so, the question to you, though. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what I want to do. Eventually. Do JSOC? Do. Yeah. But you, I, you have to go to Bragg to go for your phase two to get some insight. Or go to Bragg from the side. Because that's where um, you more than likely could pop someone's ear off. Okay. I just don't know, I mean, enough. I don't know anything about it either. Okay. I've never done it. I've never, never, never wanted to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for Bragg as an assignment or phase two or somewhere to go. Like yeah, consider Bragg if you're looking to get in that environment because that's where it's at. Okay. Cool. Thanks.